and got in last night about midnight, so I'm back in the warmer weather officially. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, they're using social media and they're using um, their people who are tired of being repressed and who are actively seeking to overthrow the government without violence and oddly without U.S. boots on the ground. So it um, has been a pretty exciting time to cover Iran and I covered and interviewed and talked to a lot of different people when I was back in Washington, D.C. about this and the effort has bipartisan which is like never happens in Washington DC but both Democrats and Republicans both strongly on board with the president's uh, tweeting saying that he's with the people of Iran and not with the government of Iran and those are two very different um, entities and this is what people need to kind of keep in mind and when I was talking to some of the Iranians there in Washington DC trying to you know, get in and, and work with the State Department and um, other agencies. I said the biggest thing you need to do is disconnect the people from the government because for the most part, as Americans, we, th we think access of evil and they all hate us and they want to bomb Israel and they want to, you know, they want nuclear weapons. And while the, the Ayatollah may want that and while the Revolutionary Guard may want that and uh, some of the secret police and military may want that, the overwhelming majority of the Iranians do not want that and let's remember the average age in Iran is about 31 and they have a higher education level than the United States of America so you put all those factors together and uh, they're saying within a year or so they think that this is this regime will finally fall change a country we've been at war for the last 16 17 18 years we're also war worried right here but I think if you look at the situation and we're going to take an access of evil country and we're going to turn them into an ally without boots on the ground and I think this is what just stumps Democrats to no end is that Trump is able to di you know differentiate here between the people and the government and I think that's what, you know, when we're seeing what's going on in Iran, you better believe North Korea is paying attention to what's going on in Iran, and you better believe Saudi Arabia is paying attention to what's going on in Iran, because those are the next countries to, to fall, because the simple fact is there are more of these people who are suppressed and repressed than there are these people in the government working for the military. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're going to be back more on the 
Yeah, they're actually, um, they're using, I mean, and I went on the Apple store to see if these apps are available. They're using, in this country, you know, a lot of people, they use WhatsApp to communicate with friends and family overseas. Well, in um, Iran, they're kind of focusing on Mobo app, which is a similar type situation. But what is going on with the Iranians, because they're actually very um, cyber savvy, they've gone in and actually hacked and put, you know, little bots and or um, the cyber warfare, you know, little bugs in these programs. So if you download these apps on your computer, it's like a virus. It'll actually take over your computer. And they're using these apps to actually control or try to control some of the protesters. So when they're communicating, trying to get together and say, okay, look, we need to meet in like an hour at this location and protest. Uh, the government on this particular issue, they usually are looking at um, social media to do so. And then also we know as of the beginning of the year, the Iranians have also really severely hampered the internet. So that makes it even more difficult for the protesters to get together, which makes this revolution all the more um, astounding because they're doing this despite heavy regime that is being very heavy handed at any time they can arrest protesters. Yesterday on World's Women's Day, they arrested 20 women protesters and they have not been heard from since. So what usually means is they're, you know, they're tortured and then they, they, they die of, of whatever, I mean, usually they say they commit suicide or something like that, but they, you know, the, the regime is trying to put down their very heavy hand while they can, but the people inside Iran are saying enough and we realize there's going to be some casualties, but we're willing to see this through. And we and they, and they take notice that the United States is actually on the side of the, the people of Iran. And the one component in all this that we haven't heard a lot about, and we've heard about it under the Obama administration a lot, because John Brennan, as you know, is a very political CIA director, but you're not seeing or hearing a lot from the CIA regarding the Iran protests and what they're doing, which means they're most likely back channeling and working with people on the ground there. And just one other point to make about this, this movement, um, they, these are all, you have to think of these groups there. They, they used to be like the Democrats and they had a Republican group and maybe an independent group and a libertarian, and they have similar type, you know, parties in Iran. But what they're doing is they're saying, forget party. We're all going to unite in this front to free our country and they will have a provisional government for six months and then they will have a free and fair elections where you know women will have the same rights as men. Now, we saw in Egypt what happened where the Muslim Brotherhood had a very good foundation work within the government and you know that's something that I pose to these groups. What are you gonna do with the government? They seem to think that they have a good enough handle with people inside the government and people realizing that tides of change are coming and they want to be on the right side of history. So hey, I'm going to, you know, I mean, again, I mean, here in America, we can't take anything for granted, but I mean, it's, it looks good. I, it looks like this is going to be the year that, you know, we finally see an end to the, the repressive regime at, you know, their 40th birthday as I put in the article, is in February coming up, and the people of Rans are determined not to allow the Ayatollah to see his 40 years in power. Isn't it amazing handling how in uh, 2009, and I had the Green Movement, yeah. as the President of the United States, the uh, Nobel Peace Prize winner, yeah. uh, and he wouldn't do anything for him. Yeah. Uh, he didn't, and I mean, and we only can speculate what kind of deal he really made with the Iranian uh, ayatollahs and mullahs and clerics. I mean, you know, they, he, they could be, they could have made, you know, you know, agreements that you know we'll work with you. Don't worry, when you leave office, you know, President Obama, we've got your back because you helped us out here. I mean, we don't know the extent of what the, these agreements were because they were done in the dark of night and Congress and Senate, they weren't allowed to even be in on this process, which is usually what the United States does is we work with our members of Congress to like work on these, you know, big, you know, deals where, you know, we're, I mean, this is a, you know, this is an access of evil country that wants to obtain nuclear weapons. And uh, it just, 
it, it, it shows the, the, the respect that the Iranian people have for the United States government. And they're actually out at rallies and they're chanting, you know, like pro-Trump chants. They love this president. And the, and the people that I interviewed and, and talked about Iran with back in Washington, D.C., they had nothing but disdain to say about the Clintons and about the Obamas. And, and even George W. Bush, I mean, they've been waiting for this change. But back in 2009, the difference, and I think I highlight this in the article too, 2009 was kind of a contentious election, like I think we're going to see coming up here in 2018 with our midterms. And so the people took to the streets because they were unhappy that their party did not win. And the difference that, you know, the MEK wants to point out in this, this is that this is where everybody is getting together and they're saying, look, for the good of the country, we're putting all of our politics aside and we are just going to take control of our country and figure it out as we go as free Iranians. And they want to rejoin the West. They want to trade with the West and the U.S. I mean, in U.S. businesses, I think this is where Trump kind of gets it as well. He's a business guy. There's a lot of money to be made in Iran right now. I mean, it's a crumbling country. That was gave. <laughs> Very different. Yeah. <laughs> Made gave. Yeah. Yeah. To that the malware that they install in these apps and when they download onto your, your computer, whoever you contact and work with through that same program, their computers and phones will be infected. And so this is a worldwide problem. This isn't just an Iranian problem. And I think you know the, the people inside Iran are also looking to Apple saying, hey, you guys might want to wake up to the fact that you're, you have an app in your app store that can potentially infect computers inside the United States. And like I said, this country is very well educated and they have a very apt cybersecurity program and they can take a lot of this information from Americans or Canadians or Russians or, or Europeans and use this information inside Iran against us. So it's not, so this is a pretty big national security problem for the United yeah. States as well. And people aren't talking about that at all. Yeah, and it yeah, and it also serves as the main propaganda and indoctrination program for people in Iran who are trying just to get by and get work and, and make a, enough money to buy food because the economy is so you know so so poorly run right now that people are literally literally I tell your I tell the listeners selling their kidneys to take care of their families. This is a country that is in the depths of depression and the people have nothing to lose right now and the United States has nothing but something to gain out of this because again I, I always say this about the access of evil why not take a country like that and make it your friend and you know the the, the people in Iran they don't want nuclear weapons they're prepared to give that up they're prepared to arrest the, the Ayatollah and his henchmen and turn them over to the world courts so they're not trying to, you know, try these people and serve retribution, um, which a lot of them probably would like to do. And, you know, when, when you're, you know, repressed for so long, it's, it's understandable. But they're looking to do the right thing here and put these people into a neutral situation where they can face the consequences for the acts of terror that they've perpetuated not only on their own citizens, but also their region. I mean, you gotta look at Yemen, you look at Hezbollah, you look at all the terrorism fronts that they're actually supporting, and you have to believe that they're selling whatever, you know, nuclear knowledge they have to North Korea as well. So, you know, it just, it, it seems like there's a lot to, of peace to be had now. And it certainly seems that uh, Trump is really up to the challenge on this, and I commend him for taking this on. Yeah. Yeah. 
in fact, this is why they're going to, they, you know, the MEK has put in place a, a provisional government, which is headed by a woman, uh, Rajabi, Miss Rajabi, who is right now in exile in France, in Paris. So she will go in and they will organize to the best of their ability and get the government in, you know, back into control. Because obviously to run a government, like there are 81 million people in Iran, so it's a, it's a pretty large country. You know, I mean, people need to get water and food, electricity needs to go, the maintenance of the roads needs to continue. So they're going to go in with, you know, and they have a lot of people that are, you know, inside the government already. Obviously, we don't know who they are for good reason. But they, they, they seem to think that within the six months, they'll be able, be able to have the country completely taken away from the Ayatollah and the, you know, the Quds Force and the uh, Revolutionary Guards as well. That then they can have elections and whatever parties they have, which they have several, they will all put up their candidates and they will all run and they will all vote and the victor will form a new government and it will probably be more of a democracy than the United States because of course we're a republic, not a democracy. Yeah, the, 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 the three words, uh, freedom, equality, uh, and the, the people. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, um, he's under sanction. Yeah, he's he's actually he's like a general, so he runs the military. He runs the the Quds Force. He runs the Revolutionary Guards, and he's the one in essence running this terror cell that's operating throughout the Middle East. So he's a very obviously very you know intelligent. He knows where all the bodies are buried, literally and figuratively, on this. And he is someone that is very dangerous, and you know he could you know, quite easily escape the country and it's something that, you know, the the people there are gonna to try to stop because he's I mean, he has the, the, the power and he has all of these followers that they've indoctrinated through the military, the secret police and whatnot to follow him and, and protect the mullahs and protect the clerics and protect the Ayatollah. They, you know, they have to make sure this is the guy. This is like the you know, the the go to guy that's been, you know, in charge over there for, you know, years and years and years. And so they have to make sure they get a hold of him. Now, the U.S. put sanctions on him um, about, I think it was a year and a half or two years ago. Yeah, for traveling. And he's since he's been seen in Moscow giving a speech. He's been in Iraq giving speeches. He's traveled all over the Middle East. And he's a, supposedly under travel sanctions where he can't leave the country. So that just goes to show you that, you know, in the region, he has a lot of allies, whether, you know, the people in Iran really like him or not. He has allies throughout the region, and he's definitely a hardliner, and he'll do just about anything to protect the Ayatollah. And as they get closer to the end date, it's going to get a little more, you know, they get more desperate, and you're going to see some more probably heinous acts of violence over there. But, um, like I said, these people are all just, they've decided that they're going to unite as a country. And they're young people. I mean, these are young people that are doing this. And women leading the charge. It's amazing to see these women, young young women, too, just out there saying, you know what, I don't care if you're going to arrest me and torture me. I'll do it for my country. It's an amazing movement to see. And it's, it, it's, it's, a, it's a, a good time to be a journalist and writing about history on this one. And I think within a year or so, we're going to see that uh, the Ayatollah is gone and we're going to have some form of democratic um, Iran. Well, you know, the people have, uh, and even the people in the United States have uh, thought about the Bahamani general. So yeah. The yeah. And I know that whenever Kennedy and Obama make the treaty with Iran, just like you say, that this guy was supposed to stay in Iran, and not go about traveling and pushing his agenda yeah. anywhere else in the world, and within a week and a half after that treaty, yeah. the most recent, uh, was made, he already broke it and nothing, nothing was yeah. No, nothing was. No, and it, and it took Trump to get the prisoners released. 
Um, it, yeah, this is, he's a very dangerous man. I mean, and he has contacts throughout the Middle East who are willing to protect him as well. And I think what, I mean, when you look at the, you look at the movement, and, and it took me a while to kind of get on board with this, because like most Americans, you're like, oh, they're brand, man, they want to kill us, they don't like us, they're, and you look at it that way, but, you know, as I did my research, did my homework, and talked to the people and realized that, you know, these, yeah, I mean, it, it's an amazing movement. again it's just you know this country I mean the one thing to keep in mind is that when the the world is at war um, there there's money to be made within the you know defense industries around the globe so it's in the benefit of them to continue all of these these wars I think people right now are looking at the situation and saying they're they're getting tired of it I'd also like just to touch briefly on I wrote something about Palestine as well and an opportunity for the president to kind of solve the Israeli-Palestinian issue, and they can, you know, folks can go to my website and look at it, um, the story. But you know, it centers around the Palestinians. Obviously, are not going to get the land back from the Israelis, at least for now. And that there in the Sinai Peninsula, there's some desolate wasteland there. And Trump, being a businessman, could you know or, organize the world to purchase this land from Egypt and allow the Palestinians to remain in their culture and their part of their world, but completely take this wasteland. And it's an opportunity for the Mark Zuckerbergs of Facebook that say they want world harmony to help and fund these these Palestinian people as they become perhaps a you know environmentally you know learn you know use how you know go in and take the ocean water and turn it into fresh water and all you know throughout the 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 Sinai Peninsula they could go in and actually take the the Elon Musk's and, and build the batteries for the Teslas and the you know these these businessmen who claim to be globalists and want the best for the world they could actually kind of underwrite some of this stuff and then when the when they start making money through recycling programs or what have you they build schools and hospitals and they can become their own their own new country. It's happened before. It hasn't happened since World War One, really. So, I mean, it's an, it's an opportunity for Trump to kind of go in and take that Palestinian issue away from the Middle East. And without those tensions between those two countries, Iran and Palestinians, you have men, you have Middle East peace. And what what a what a you know true you know honor and legacy for the president to have is to kind of obtain that Middle East peace. So I encourage your listeners to go read the story that um, on Palestine because it's also a very thoughtful piece. And and I know it's another country we look at where they're terrorists and they're getting paid to be martyrs. Their families are and all that. But it, it, it's a solvable problem as well, and when we see the internet and we see what's going on in the Middle East, we see what's going on in these repressed countries, there is hope, and I think Palestine it can be part of that, um, that access of hope maybe instead of access of evil. Katie Report. Yep. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> no, I'm going golfing. Forget this. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's me. 